the Anthrozoology Podcast, episode 16. I'm Michelle Sidlowski, and I am an assistant professor of anthrozoology. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm a PhD student from Exeter University, and my interest is cats, cat-human relations, and discourses surrounding free-roaming cats. Hi, my name is Sarah Oxley-Heaney. I'm a second-year part-time PhD student at the University of Exeter, uh, and I'm looking at uh, shark-human interactions. Thank you. Well, today we're honored to welcome Scottish poet Gordon Mead. Gordon's 10th collection of poems, inspired by photographs taken by Joanne MacArthur, is entitled Zoo Speak. Welcome to the program, Gordon. Thank you. Cheers. Glad to be here. Well, we here at the podcast uh, write and speak a lot about the human tendency to use language as a tool of separation from other than human animals, uh, to control the narrative of those other than human lives. Your work instead seems to use language as a tool to highlight the many species with whom we share our lives. So it seems like other than human species have featured in your work for decades. So can you start by explaining sort of your early experiences with other than human animals and why they continue to feature so prominently in your work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've been writing now for about well, just over 30 odd years. Um, I was born in the countryside. My father was uh, a grain merchant. I went around various farms with him uh, quite often, especially during the summer, to collect grain samples, etc. And so I was always interested in in animals. And when I started writing, uh, my first sort of influences really were the works of uh, Ted Hughes. Seamus Heaney, people like that, who, who also read, wrote a lot about animals. So that's really where it came about as far as my writing is concerned. Um, I suppose my, a, a deeper interest, if you, if you like, in the actual seeing, trying to see things from animals' point of view, uh, really came from when I became aware of Joanne MacArthur's work, uh, which was in, uh, 2016, I think it was, I came across our first collection, We Animals. And that, uh, that's what got me interested in, in, in trying to, to write about animals or from, from their viewpoint, if you like. But it really was the, the second book, Captive, which came at uh, quite a difficult time in my life. Uh, and when I just saw those images, uh, I was just really... I had, had to say something about it, really. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's talk for just a minute about your newest work, Zoo Speak. Um, Deidre Hines described how you highlight that liminal space that's occupied by animals in zoos. And rather than representing the so-called best aspects of these zoos, uh, your photos and poems, like the fact that these living beings that are meant to be protected and nurtured are often instead made invisible by their presence in zoos. Uh, as zoos focus on those larger issues such as conservation and research and education, the animals housed there can be forgotten. So it feels like your work asks us to notice those invisible beings. So was witnessing the suffering of other, other than human animals your plan or did it sort of just arise organically from your viewing of those photographs that you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself, I mean, obviously Joanne is, as well as a photographer and animal activist, I certainly wouldn't uh, call myself an activist in that, in that way. Uh, my uh, contact with animals, apart from our, our dog, our pet dog is very li limited uh, in a sort of face-to-face -face, um, experience. But it was, it definitely was seeing, the, seeing those photographs. And just the idea of the idea of captivity, not just for uh, maybe even non-human animals, but just how that uh, sort of went over onto the onto the human side of things as well. And uh, the poems really came from just trolling trolling through the book and seeing what images really uh, moved me to write about. So uh, you mentioned you don't consider yourself an activist. Would you consider yourself more of an advocate or uh, just uh, a storyteller or? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm getting getting towards being an, an advocate mm -hmm. <laughs> just through this book. And uh, my next book is going to be uh, with poems taken from the uh, Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene, Joanne's latest work, which has her own photographs and other photographers, uh, photographs about animals in all sorts of different situations in which they've been, well, the only word for it really is abused. Uh, factory farming, industrial fishing, fashion, etc. So, so that I'm I'm moving towards that way. It took took me a long time to uh, see myself as a poet rather than someone that just wrote poems. So, I think it'll take me a while before I can actually see myself as a certainly as an activist. But advocates more more near the point. I think, yeah. I like the term advocate it's a little less inflammatory sometimes yeah um, i have a question that follows up from that if you don't mind um do you it seems that you're a, a bit of a, a not a reluctant active advocate but a, a maybe an underconfident advocate for animals yeah that might be true yeah yeah i mean i, I think I suppose it's the idea of anthropomorphism. Certainly in, in my early work, I was criticized quite a bit because of that. I've just recently come across the term strategic anthropomorphism. And that I've never come across that, but that's probably where I'm at. It's sort of using, uh, using language, obviously human language, to try and express uh, what animals are going through in various situations. Um, because I think one of the challenges we all have um, when we're writing and we're trying to speak for animals is um, what's in it for the animal? What are we getting from it? And what are the, what are the animals that we write about getting from it? Um, and it's a, definitely a challenge um, I think we all find. So um, following on from the advocate question, it, it, what, what do you think the, uh, is in it for the animals? And um, do, you, do you have any... Um, have you got any plans to actually start um, maybe targeting some of the audiences that you're actually uh, that about that you're writing about? So, for example, um, you you were you were talking about the captive animals. Um, did you actually put any of your work in um, areas where people were going deliberately to view captive animals? And will you do that for? Uh, industrial, uh, the animals that are, are in basically in industrial captivity. Thanks. That's a good question. Um, I haven't up till now, no, but that's something that does, it's beginning to bother me a bit more because obviously, I mean, poetry is not read by many people. So I'm aware now that, that, that what I'm writing about is more, I suppose, more overtly political than it has been in the past. And the idea of trying to trying to get that to a larger audience uh, is, would be the only way that it could actually help animals by in, impacting on the humans that are working around them. So that might be it's, it's something that I haven't really uh, practically thought about what I could do about, but it's certainly something that I might think about in the future. Yeah. Thank you. So following on from this, this idea of um, speaking for animals or giving them a, a, a voice. Um, so this is something that I struggle with in my own work, writing about cats is I, I want to give the cats a voice, but I, I don't want to speak for them. And I'm, I'm really aware. So I also sort of listen to how people talk about cats. And some people think that a cat kept inside an apartment, it's the worst torture ever. And that cat's being imprisoned. Other people look at a cat on the street and immediately think that they're, um, yeah, they're suffering, that they're, they're uncared for, um, when, when the truth is, is more nuanced. So it's, it's people projecting their ideas. So some people are just thick that street cats and live miserable lives. Other people think house cats live miserable lives. And I'm trying to sort of get more of the cat's perspective and, and sort of highlight that. Uh, but it's a constant struggle with the, the speaking about versus um, um, speaking for so I guess when I'm, I'm thinking of your poetry with zoo animals it's um, so this isn't my field of expertise I'm not sort of I wouldn't call myself yeah that familiar with um, zoo species but I and I can't 
think of any I can't um recall any references at the moment but it's my understanding that the what they call the less charismatic animals so the sort of smaller um so the smaller species that their suffering tends to be less and um I should actually try and find remember what those those references are to, to put in the link below but um there's some evidence that it's the big charismatic animals the ones that people tend to go and see the tigers the lions um the elephants that that that's what draws people to the zoos and that and they're the ones that that do suffer the most from from being captive um so i guess my point is is sort of yeah it, it's good to sort of highlight that and then people can sort of see that it's not right that um, a particular animal is enclosed in a small space and really sort of get them to think about that. But I guess my, my long winded question is to sort of how do you sort of, um, yeah, bridge that speaking for or, or giving them a voice versus sort of maybe um, doing what my cat people do when they, they say that a cat is miserable when maybe they're not. Right. OK. Uh, I mean, I think that's difficult. Um... I was quite, I was quite aware, really, I, going into this, I wasn't so aware of, of things like zoochosis um, and the, the sort of mental trauma that animals can go through in captivity. And again, it was, again, I've got to go back to the photographs. It was really the, what I took from the photographs that perhaps allowed me to sort of imagine that experience. And the more I, I read a little bit around it, and the more I read, it was obvious to me that the animals that people see in zoos are not, not representative of their species in the wild. Mm -hmm. So this was, this was part of the, the writing of Zoo to, to Speak, was to try and give voice to these animals that have been damaged in some way. So that made it... <laughs> It made it both more difficult for me and and easier in a way. I felt I felt I could say more uh, from a human point of view, trying to trying to talk as if I was an animal in that way. Whereas maybe the next thing I'll be going on to is, is to try and to try and see or imagine what it would be for it to be a an animal in the wild, if you like, that has mm. not been hampered by this, which is. I think will be even more difficult to try and try and pull off in that way. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's the key, right? To to try and get people to think and and try and put yourself in that position. And I think that's a really valuable tool. Um, yeah, to yeah, basically, but it's about getting people to think, right? And also sort of looking from a different um, um, yeah perspective. So so I was wondering, I was actually surprised when you said that poetry didn't really reach a lot large audience because um for me it seems just more accessible outside of academia to sort of um yeah experience poetry you you don't need to anybody can experience poetry right even if they can't write it and um and I find hearing I've, I've heard you read um a few times and I actually find it quite impactful and especially with that image there um it, it seems to me like a perfect tool to 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 branch out and reach reach that larger audience um and I would actually be super interested to see how people felt about captive animals before and after reading some of your poetry, um, people that weren't exposed to. So maybe people are like, yeah, yeah I love going to the zoo and, and seeing um, the sun bear and um, and then sort of hearing that and then maybe thinking, um, yeah, I, I just wondered. Yeah, I actually think that poetry could be quite impactful. So I was surprised um, to hear well, you say that you didn't think it was. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I should uh, be a bit more confident about that in, in, in future. Um, I just feel it's. I think a lot of a lot of poets probably would would be would be saying differently than I do regarding that. But uh, it's, it's, it's certainly it's my experience that it is. It's quite a niche a niche area, but it is something that, uh, as, as I think Sarah said, that something that I could try and try and bring into the into public arena more, yeah. Well, I would very much like to incorporate some of your poems in my uh, anthropology classes because part of, the, part of the problem is finding those accessible 
readings, right? That that paint a good picture. And we talk a lot in my classes about responsible anthropomorphism. Just like you you said, it is, it's you know, it's a tool. You can use it for really good things or really bad things. And so we talk about that that tendency of us to use it in a negative way. And yet here's a perfect example of, of using it in a positive way. And I think that really that will help a lot of people connect more to the stories. Oh, that's that good. I'd be glad I'd be glad to hear what, what sort of response you got from that. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to try it and see. I think they'll really like it. Um, yeah, and, and in fact, I was just thinking um, along the lines of what Michelle was saying about the negative and the positive. Um, I'm hoping to do some research um, early next year, and I'm hoping to highlight a positive shark human interactions. I wanted to just switch gears for a minute and ask you about your. Um, sort of the poems themselves, the structure of the poems in Zoo Speak. You use yeah. the, the repetition and the scaffolding to really paint a picture. And I'm just curious how you came uh, to, to, to realize that that would represent that lived experience of those captive animals. You know, what led you to that structure? Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's totally different from anything I've done before. And I, I don't think I'll be doing it again. Uh, it was very much, <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's just because it wasn't it was not contrived in any way um but uh the first one i wrote about was the, the malayan sun bear and that was the first image that really struck me of the, the bear with its paw up against the, the glass of its enclosure and i just i wrote the first three lines and then i thought well that's it was almost a haiku type thing and i thought well that's not enough and the other line came, and then the poem more or less came as a as a whole, so without the breaks in it. But then when I started looking at it, it seemed to, in some ways, it it seemed to be too too demonstrative coming from that creature in in a one off almost. And the idea of giving this break, and also there's slight subtle differences in each stands as it goes along it was a way of trying to trying to give a, a sort of what i felt might be the way that creature would would try and express where it was in in a more sort of hesitant way and a more adding on to it sort of way of 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 just just trying to explain and making the point again and again but then different slightly differently as it, as it went on and obviously it, the idea of it trying to then mirror how a lot of captive animals how they move from side to side or they go around in circles around a particular pathway within their enclosure that was certainly part of the idea of that sort of side of the of the structure of it then using using the the, the first person was to bring it more to be more personal obviously and again using the present tense throughout the book just to make it more more impactful so that you weren't looking at something in the past it was it was something that they were living through all the time yeah. and i very much picked up on that that stereotypy behavior as i was reading the poems i saw that very clearly so i think that really came through Good. and i think that it also the poem hyena really spoke to me um, because you're going down that path that those that repetition that scaffolding and then the end is so very almost shocking even though you sort of know where it's going to go the end is very shocking and I'm wondering if do the poems come to you sort of do you know where it's going to end when you start or does it build for you as well yeah it builds and obviously not in the I can't remember whether further down the line I was actually writing them in the way they appear on the on the page i.e three lines then four I think that was something that, that I got the structure and then I used my first draft to fit into that structure but I'd know you're, you're right I had no idea where it was going at all uh, I never do with my poems and that's that's one of the it's one of the most enjoyable things about it because you don't know where you're going with it uh, Obviously, the, the other side is there won't be all successful, but um, 
yeah, I, I don't set out to, this is what I'm going to say about a hyena in this situation sort of thing. No. And I think it really works. Maybe that's why the ending is so surprising because you can feel that sort of sense of not knowing. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's true. I don't know about, I think I've talked to a few other poets and they're quite similar in that way that uh, the ending of a, the ending of a poem if it if it if it works well, usually is a bit of a surprise uh, when you're finishing off. Yeah, I think the repetition as well. It just shows, or it speaks of um, the relentlessness for these animals. Like people go into the to the to the mall in Pattaya and uh, see the sun bear, and then they've gone and they're doing their shopping. That that sun bear is still there all the time, constantly. Um, I remember seeing, uh, I've seen um, whale shark that was uh, in a, it was in an aquarium in Dubai at one point, that's now since released, um, that was in a shopping mall and the, the noise, you, you think about the noise, uh, the, obviously the sharks and the mantas and, not mantas, the sharks and the rays and the fish is still there, you just think about the constant noise that these animals that have and that's relentless as well. And um, it's, yeah, it's very, well, I think when I first started listening to, because I listened to it on YouTube, so started listening, um, I, was, I was wondering about the repetition and then you could just kind of feel the beat of it's the same all the time. And as you say, that's, that's stereotypy. It's very, um, very effective. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you obviously seem very, empathetic with animals and you said that you were challenged by people um using the word the term anthropomorphism um mm. have you developed um a confidence and a strategy now in able to be able to uh revoke that or refute that i ask this because i think we've all been through this when we're first challenged with anthropomorphism it's like oh hold on a minute and then you know you have to think about how you're gonna explain while you're yeah. speaking for um yeah i mean i think yeah i mean i don't to be honest i don't care anymore <laughs> what people <laughs> think about it um and that's taken a long time really um and i think certainly writing zoo speak in some ways it it, it made me look back at my earlier work uh and yeah i mean i just feel i feel that i've been on this on this uh, trail and this is where I've where I, where it's led me so far, and I'm 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 happy to see where it might lead lead on. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm curious. So, and I guess this is poetry in general. I I feel the biggest impact when I listen to it when it's sort of read read in the correct way. Um, and yeah, I sort of yeah love your accent and hearing you you read the poems. It sort of brings it alive more than just seeing it on a piece of paper. Uh, but that in itself is, a, is, is, is part of the poem, right? And I just wonder how you felt hearing your poetry be, being read by somebody else. So I was imagine, imagining Michelle presenting it to her class and reading it out or getting the students to read it out. And, and, and I'm curious if it would have, yeah. I, I'm just curious how you would feel about um, that, whether it would seem wrong or, um, yeah, I, I'm curious. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because once the... I think you're right that uh, hearing anyone read a poem is better than just reading it off the page. It gives so much more to it. Mm -hmm. But once a poem's written, then it's, it is sort of out there and it's out there to be interpreted by other people and uh, performed, if you, if, you, if you like, by other people. It's interesting though, that uh, I do quite a lot of readings um, and tour with a friend of mine and on one occasion in Germany, the person that was introducing us, we, we read our poems, and then he said, it'd be really interesting if Gordon reads one of Desmond's poems and Desmond reads mm. one of Gordon. Yeah. And uh, both of us were sort of, ooh, really aghast to begin with. <laughs> uh, but it did, it worked really well. And it's interesting because it does, it does add something different to it, uh, depending who's reading the poem. I think it's totally valid for anyone anyone to do so, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about uh, a panther in Enver Zoo. Uh, I really 
found that poem meaningful for sort of a strange reason. It, to me, it was very resonant of this process that we've all gone through that I think a lot of anthropologists, uh, advocates go through as they're first discovering that other species have a theory of mind, that other species have a social life, they have sentience. Um, mm -hmm. First, we feel like we need to get away from it. We need to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. Then we get fascinated by it. Um, and then we, we spend some time living in the situation. And then we're faced with this sort of lingering angst that can't we can't get away from. And I'm wondering if if your poems and those images that inspired them, do they get lodged in your psyche? Do you have animal images that haunt you or some of the poems haunt you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the images perhaps, and I think the, the way of the writing of the poems is a way to sort of almost to exercise them. Once 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 the poems then it sort of frees me perhaps maybe to, well with the zoo speak to look at more which is not so good but but yeah I think uh, I think that's definitely true and and again there's this why I didn't say I was a um, an activist is that initially my interest comes from the, from the poetry really so that one the Panther in Edinburgh Zoo was written for when Ted Hughes died. It was a, it was a, an in memoriam for Ted Hughes, and it also it references a poem by Rilke about a, a panther he saw in zoo in, in Paris. So that's where that's where the impulse comes from, I think, or where they they both meet, the wanting to write, and then finding an image or an image coming up that allows me to do that. Uh, but I do have, I do have quite a few memories from childhood that do that surface from time to time, and quite a few of them are to do with animals. Uh, so that's when where these poems come from. Yeah. So the panther at the end, um, I was reading this morning. I don't have it in front of me. Um, he he basically looks at you, doesn't he? And 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 he kind of he have you have you got the ending to it? The anybody? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, the last, the last. Um, yeah, the last couple of lines. But nothing could touch the nothingness I had seen in its eyes, and to this day, no darkness has ever matched the blackout of its bristling skin. So, so even even though you were writing the poem at that time, for other reasons than the animal it obviously unconsciously the animal has definitely spoken to your subconscious and you put it into into words there's a hauntingness yeah, yeah. about those lines sure hi because i do i mean i do it when i when i read that poem i can i can remember so, the feelings i had then you know just uh, the, the darkness of its particular cage where it was kept yeah yeah definitely yeah definitely haunting we're talking about talking about pictures and the poems that go with them without having the actual photographs you know oh. visible which is also a little bit it's a challenge you know to to represent really the the whole project without the images right there so we'll just simply have to encourage people to pick up the book yeah mm. i guess <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly felt that very strongly with with writing the poems that uh, these particular poems did need the visual side of, of it as well. And I was just very lucky that uh, Joe liked the, the poems so much to become involved in the, in the project. I actually, when I was looking at Zoo Speak, I was reading the poems on purpose first, prior to looking at the photographs, just because after looking up some of the other poems online, I was very moved by them without having seen the pictures and I thought well this will be a really good way to really get this vision in in my head and then see how it compares and I actually found it almost more shocking that way you know more moving more haunting as it were I think to to read and get the image in your mind and then be hit with the, the actual image. Well that's an interesting way to go about it yeah well, that's good I'm glad the poems you felt the poems stood on their own without the image and 
think they're definitely do. I mean, I haven't been fortunate enough to see the photographs in Zoo Speak. I've seen, uh, I did a bit of um, Googling and I found the sun bear. And uh, the poem about, about um, the, the bones bit washing up in the med on the beach, I was, I was really curious to know what that was. And eventually I found the article about the cow carcass yeah. washing wash up. And um, I mean, they're just, they're, 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 it, it's, it's interesting how people say, or there's the, the old adage, a uh, picture paints a thousand words. But I think your words paint more about the animal who was rather than just there's a dead carcass on a beach and people are horrified. It reminds people, the poem reminds people, I was somebody. You didn't value me, but I was somebody. And that's kind of uh, straight to the throat, I think, definitely. Uh, that's really good to hear, really good to hear. Because, I mean, I felt, I felt it difficult writing the poems for Zoo Speak, but the, the, the next book, the exposed ones, I find even more challenging and uh what i'm actually trying to do with the new ones they're a lot shorter but i'm trying to do exactly what you're saying is, is to try and to try and present the animal all not out with its situation but it's a, an existence apart from it although where it ends obviously with the with the hidden uh book is usually through death uh whether it's fishing uh, fashion or whatever but it's the idea of trying to trying to uh, trying to honor the animal as well yeah I think it's a really nice idea and um, they're just forgotten they're just forgotten so quickly and over in a meal or a coat or a or, or never actually they're never actually made into made into something that sounds awful to say but they're never actually they just can be discarded you know even yeah. before it's just as collateral damage so it, it is it's very very poignant i think i was looking at and i don't know how old this one is i think it's quite old uh older the the bass rock yeah that's yeah that's a very old poem yeah, yeah. Poem. and the reason i was looking up some of the older ones was to to look at that evolution of bringing in the animal as it were and i was just surprised I guess because I think a lot of people sort of change their perspective through life I was surprised that already even back in the 90s that there was this sense of uh, other species being part of our lives and being um, part of that world making and, and life sharing as opposed to just being I'm here they're there there was very much that that connectivity even from back then yeah I mean I think that's true I mean I it's again, again, it's coming from it from my side, coming from the poetic side of it. That I was very I mentioned Ted Hughes and Shea Massini. When I started writing, I was really impressed by how they could almost, uh, especially Hughes, get inside an animal, get inside where it, where it's from, and write in that way. And that's always been something that I've tried to do. And I think it's, it's, I'd say it's only been the last seven or eight years that, if you like, my lifestyle has caught up with my imagination in that way. So that I, you know, I, I, had, no, I had no problems writing about animals and eating them then. Whereas now that would be something I couldn't really do. Um, but it's, it's interesting that it's, it's almost come from, the developments come from my imagination and then various things that have happened in my life quite recently has, has, has brought the two together. In that are, you, are you a vegetarian? Uh, I'm, I'd say I, I'm definitely vegetarian. I'm probably 90, 99% vegan, mm -hmm. uh, but there are still, still areas that I find challenging, put it that way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, most of, most of the time, certainly eating wise, I'm, I'm probably, yeah, probably totally vegan. Yeah. I think it takes a while to become vegan because we're so entangled with uh, utilizing animals for, for our food. 
that uh, you know, it takes a while to extract us from ourselves from that. And you have to gain a, not a lot of knowledge to be able to do that as well. It's, it's, uh, it's not easy. No, it's, it's funny because I, I thought, I mean, I've read quite a few people. Oh, I saw this, I saw that, I became veg vegan like this. Whereas for me, it's been a, it's far more uh, gradual. Yeah. I think it's difficult. It is a big learning experience. And it's also a commitment to read everything and, and acquaint yourself with where everything comes from. And yeah, it's... Well, I did want to ask you about sort of zoos in general. Prior to Zoo Speak, yeah. where would you rate your feeling about zoos as not just um, entertainment venues? I'm talking about zoos as conservation venues and um, uh, species survival venues. Where would you place your feelings on zoos before Zoo Speak and now? Okay, well, I mean, before, before Zoo Speak, I mean, uh, going way back, I was aware that it was wrong, wrong to keep animals in captivity. But we had, uh, we used to take our daughter to the zoo in Edinburgh uh, to let her see the animals, because it was the only way she was ever going to be able to interact face to face with these sorts of animals. And then I suppose, I don't know whether the writing of Zoo Speaks changed me so much. So pre Zoo Speak, I'd say for the last 10, 15 years, I've been unhappy about the fact that the way animals are kept in zoos. Now the idea of, of protecting endangered species through breeding programs, et cetera, that sort of thing. Uh, survival, these, are, these aspects are all well and good, but the actual enclosures in which the animals exist would have to be a lot better, it would have to be you know, far, far more space for them uh, and just treated in a totally different way. So I have, I have problems with, with the good that zoos can do, uh, really. And especially when you look at, uh, when you see say birds caged and they'd have the whole sky and aquariums, especially when you think of, you know, whales. I, I, I wrote a, a sequence, a series of poems about the um, blackfish um, documentary. And it's just horrendous to think that they have, they, these animals have the whole oceans in which to survive. And no matter how large their tank could be there's no way it's going to replicate that i think the sad part too is that there's no you know you can't re-release those animals there's no there's no good end to that captivity because it is the only choice at, at this point for a lot of especially the, the animals like orcas that have to be kept in in large you know tanks there is no other option for them so then yes reconsidering perhaps the breeding programs and and so I don't fall into that category of being um, necessarily anti-zoo like a lot of uh, anthropologists. Um, I do definitely think that our, our enclosures need to be changed. Um, I, I do accept the fact that there are some animals that should not ever be in captivity. And I think elephants are, are one of those species that should never be in captivity. Um, but it is one of those weird sort of cognitive dissidence areas where I, I understand the need for them, but I also am sort of horrified by the process of zoos, yeah. especially since moving to the American South where it's not all lovely accredited zoos that are actually working toward the health and welfare of their animals. It's very much roadside zoos and people's backyards that, that have a lot of these uh, issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question about the deer, the deer, the poem about the deer in the USA. Um, that you wrote. Um, for some reason, it's been kind of lingering in my head. Um, I, it's, it's interesting how there's that, there's that movie um, technique that they, they use where they kind of like, everything else zooms out and, and it zooms on to one person or onto an object. I don't know what the actual um, effect is called, but you, you become very aware of the one 
um, objects that uh, it's looking at. And of course, in this case, the deer was a person and is now an object, but you're speaking mm. about the deer as, as, as he or her was still a person. Yeah. And, um, I, and now all I can think about is this deer's head being transported from A to B across uh, New York for some reason. I don't know if you mentioned New York in your, in your poem, but what, did you see this head? What made you write a poem about a deer's head being taken? I'm assuming it's like a trophy. It was a trophy head. Again, it, it, wasn't in the, it wasn't in the captive book, but it was in, in one of Joe's earlier books, We Animals. It was a photograph uh, that she had taken. And I just, I just, the photograph talked to me really, just the, uh, I'm looking at it now, and it's just the, the eyes of both the deer and the woman that's that's carrying it, uh, the deer is transfixed on the carrier, whereas the woman has obviously been caught, if you want to see in both ways, but caught by the camera and she's turned and she's looking straight at the camera. And it was just the juxtaposition of that that I really, really got me. And it, similar to what we were talking about, that the relentlessness that the it was a good introduction, I think, to the to the poems that were coming. That the deer, its gaze, obviously not a real gaze, but its gaze is totally always fixed at straight ahead, whereas the woman has the freedom to be to be doing what she wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think a, if? You, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just the backstory to the to the photograph. Unfortunately, I've uh, forgotten in what context it was in the book. In, in Joe's book. Right, okay. I mean, you, you seem very connected to, um, to, to, the way, to the way that you feel animals think or have thought or would be thinking. It's, very, it's almost spiritually spiritual in some respects. Do you find that with people as well? And if, and whether you do or not, um, do you think if you saw these animals directly, you would be even more affected and your poems would be, be even more powerful? That's, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can answer that because I don't know whether I'll, I'll ever find myself in that position. Um, but I think, I don't know. Because it's it's difficult with with poetry because sometimes you don't you do write about things that really uh, affect you, but if it was if it was almost too I think it would take longer for me to write about it. I think that, that using the photographs gave me a sort of a safety valve, a distance from what I'm writing about. Whereas if I was if I was to see even just even just to go to a slaughterhouse to actually see that. I think it probably would take longer for it to, to percolate through me to be able to write about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, because it's not just visual, is it? You've got the audio, the smells, all of the other senses are affected as well. And it's not just that one single image that you're... No. Then the impact it's... Would, would be stronger. Yes, yeah. yeah. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, so I... Um... So, so there's been a, a lot more interest in a growing interest, I guess, in recent years of collaborations between um, scientists and artists. Um, and I see that a little bit in your book with the merging with Joanne MacArthur's images. So you've got the images and the, the emotions sort of coming together and, and bringing, bringing this alive. Um, I wonder if you have been involved in at all of considered sort of collaborating sort of from the science aspect, so bringing in because that's what I think is great about poetry is it brings in this emotion or it brings yeah emotions to light to life um and I'm sort of yeah science background so my default writing style is very um clinical this is the facts and it's sort of I straddle to to yeah I guess express sort of the more richer human and other animal experiences and um yeah so this is why I think it's great that um, scientists and artists are a lot more open to sort of collaborating and sort of meshing those two worlds together and I, I think it's it's enriching for everyone and I, I wondered if you'd sort of consider that or been involved at all with um, 
yeah, sort of connecting your work that way to to bridge that that gap? Um, not not up till now. Uh, I know that there was a project a couple of years ago that some some poets uh, were married with with scientists, and a, a sort of pamphlet came out uh, from that work, and it was very interesting. Uh, and it would be something I'd be I'd be happy mm -hmm. to try definitely. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how how the writing of maybe the scientist involved and the poet involved mm -hmm. might change. They might take things from each other as well in in, the, in their own different styles. So it would be something be very interesting to do. Yeah. Might make those academic papers easier to read. Well, I just wanted to ask sort of as a, a final question, you do a lot of work with uh, young people and writing workshops with young people. And I was wondering what, uh, and if, I, if I'm correct, at-risk young people generally, is that yeah. correct? Not so much uh, now, just for health reasons, but yeah, that's certainly something okay. in the past. I was just wondering what sort of response you got with this uh, from, the, from the Zoo Speak style of, of writing, that awareness of those, animal intelligences and, and did, did you get any feedback from uh, younger people about that? Did it really resonate with them? Well, I, I, the, the, the kids I was working with were, were very young, uh, uh, up to about 10 years old. Oh, and okay. six, and, six and 10, so it didn't really, really touch on that aspect of it. But uh, some of the ways that we did do it was, um, uh, sort of uh, an exercise with animal families and they, they, they had to imagine themselves, their parents, their siblings as animals. And uh, that was that was very interesting because I mean some of them were some of them were quite as you think of of children's um, children coming across poetry, lots of it is is uh, very humorous and and there's nothing wrong with humorous poetry. But I certainly found with, with some of the, the, the kids, they did have an empathy uh, to, to animals. And it's funny, what well, I forgot about that. One of the things we did, one of the days out we did, we took them to Edinburgh Zoo. That's mm -hmm. right. And, and, and they wrote, I've forgotten all about that. They did write about captive animals. They, they, they could see that, that they were captive. And uh, yeah, they did have, it had a, a big effect on them really, yeah. I think that's important and with this push toward you know starting humane education much earlier and, and teaching about the the needs and feelings and desires of of the human species i think that ties right into it this introduction to all sorts of different ways of expressing yourself is so important yeah very much so um i just uh, if you could just explain a bit more about the the new book you've mentioned it in passing a couple of times um, that would be interesting. Right, exposed. It's going to be ex called exposed animal elog animal elegies, and uh, as I said, they're quite quite short. They're in about uh, four stanzas, four lines each, very short, and they're taken, as I say, from images that Joe took and other another handful of po uh, photographers in her book, Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene. And it's in about seven sections. And as I said, dealing with uh, factory farming, industrial fishing, faith, um, fashion. What else have we got? I can't remember, I can't remember. But they, they're different, different aspects to the ways non-human animals are abused, and I found I found it more difficult to write than the captive, in some way, mm -hmm. just because with the, with the captive animals they are captive, and it's it's a, it's a horrible life sentences. But uh, these animals, uh, their lives are being cut short very quickly, and in very inhumane, if there's any humane way of doing it, but certainly very inhumane methods. So, so that is, but it, it, again, it will be similar to Zoo Speak in that each, each poem will have a, a visual image to which it refers. 
and this is going to come out in October this year. Yeah. I do very much like that tying together of the image with, with the poem. I think it just helps send it home for a lot of people. It just makes it more real. So no, I think I think it's essential in, in this in this way that I'm working with Joe's anyway. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Gordon. That was fantastic. That's good. Really glad to be here. Thanks for joining the Anthrozoology podcast for a discussion with poet Gordon Mead. Join us next episode, where we will discuss Dr. Chris Hill's work on tattoo narratives, kinship, and grief work. Thank you and have a lovely day.